Sorry, guys. All right. I want to welcome you to Marvelous Mammals, which is an educator webinar. It is the second in a series of webinars that we've been doing for the month of June, focusing on different groups of animals. So last week in honor of Amphibian Week, we did a, a webinar on amphibians. This week we're doing marvelous mammals. Next week is going to be on fish and the final week in June we're going to be looking at birds. And kind of the same format for these webinars is I'm going to be talking about this group of animals. So we're going to be talking about mammals today, talking about some of the cool things about them, what makes a mammal a mammal, some of their conservation and management of of them, their status around the world, and then in, interjected throughout there, we're also going to be talking about some activities that you can bring into your classroom as educators. Again, this one is intended to be for educators. It doesn't mean that if you're not a current teacher or a museum educator, whatever it might be, that you won't get anything out of this. It just is structured to be designed for people who might take this information back to some kind of classroom or something like that. Let me just deal with some general housekeeping. I see a, a number of familiar faces or familiar names, at least on the on the participation list. But just in case you haven't been to one of my webinars before, you should realize now that the micro your microphones are muted and they will remain muted throughout the presentation. This is going to be me primarily talking um, at you and kind of sharing some information. Um, there will be ways for you to interact. There's a couple times where I'm going to ask you some questions throughout the presentation. Um, and I'm going to want hopefully some feedback from you. You can do that through uh, one of two ways. There are two chat options that you have. One of those is the actual chat box, and one of those is the Q&A box. It doesn't matter which one you use. You only need to use one of them. I am actually monitoring both of them. It doesn't matter um, which whichever one is easiest for you to find on your particular control panel. Um, let's go ahead and test this right now. So if, if you have the chat box, it's going to be it's going to look like a little chat bubble or something like that. The Q&A box, I think, actually says Q&A or something like that. What I want you to do is find one of those boxes. And in it, if you'll just tell me where you're listening from, just the city that you're listening from, or if you're not in Arizona, that's great, too. You can tell us kind of what um, what area of the world you're listening from or the country. Um, if you'll go ahead and put that into the, either the chat box or the Q and A box. Then that that serves two purposes. One, I get to know my audience just a little bit, and also I can recognize um, that people can understand and and know how the the interaction is going to work here, and 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 can find the appropriate boxes on there, on there. Um, while you're putting that in, let me just tell you a couple things. I am the only one running this webinar. So some webinars you've participated in the past, there, there's been a presenter, but there also might be a host who's kind of. Um, monitoring all the back channel stuff, making sure that the, the chat is working, scanning the chat, all those different types of things. I'm the only one doing all of that. So if you hear me pause for a minute, it may be that I'm actually reading something that came through on the chat, um, and that's perfectly fine. Um, I'm going to try to answer all the questions as, as we go through. Um, so just, just be aware that, you know, have a little bit of patience as I go through here. If I have to, if I repeat myself or it sounds like I'm out for a minute, it may be that I'm just reading a little. Uh, this presentation is being recorded, so if you have any technical difficulties, um, you, there, there will be an opportunity for you to see it later. I think it's uh, there, there's an automatic way where I can get that to you, but also um, I do a little bit of editing on the recording, and then I, I add it to our website. That'll probably take me about a month or two to get that up to the website. Um, so if for some reason you do miss it, there is opportunities, or, or you get disconnected or anything like that happens, there are ways to, to be able to see this a little bit later. When you log out at the end of the presentation, once you shut down your window, there should be a pop-up survey that comes up. I understand that it does not work for everyone. Some people get the pop-up survey, some don't. I'm guessing it has to do with um, a setting you might have on as for a pop-up blocker or something like that. If you don't get it, don't worry about it. It's not the end of the world. But if you do get it, I would appreciate you spend a minute or two just answer the few questions that are on there and tell me how you um, what you felt about this this webinar that helps us plan for future webinars and then finally within about an hour after this pre this webinar is completed you're going to get an automated follow-up email the email comes directly from our system and what it's going to have is a link on there when you click on that it's going to take you to a website where you're going to be able to download your certificate. So for those educators here that are looking at getting an hour of professional development or continuing education credit for your um, recertification, then that, that'll be attached in that email on that website. Also, there will be a link to all of the resources that we're talking about today. So if you see a really cool lesson that we're talking about, I'm going to be showing you it's all going to be on that website. So you're going to get a 
resources, resources we talk about, and then some. So you're going to get access to tons of different um, mammal-related resources today. It's going to happen. Um, and that's how this is going to work a little bit. If you are interested, we've, we've gotten a couple questions the last few work, uh, webinars that I've done where people want to be able to um, see the other questions that people are asking and kind of get an idea. Unfortunately, the way that this particular we're set up that you can't do that you i can see everybody's chat that's coming through you might not be able to see everybody else's that's in there and that's perfectly fine if for some reason you wanted to see a transcript of some of the questions that people asked i save that at the end as well so that'll be available i do at the end try to go through all the questions so um, i'm going to spend some time at the end making sure i've gone through the chat and through the q a to make sure there aren't any lingering questions that haven't been answered but that is available at the end if anybody is, is really interested in that so let me um Take a look. Some of you have been, have given me some responses. Let's see where some people are listening from today. Um, we have looks like we have Glendale and Phoenix and Mesa being represented. Tolleson kind of got Northeast, Central, and and West being represented here as well. We have Tucson. Um, a number from Tucson. We have Gilbert and Payson, so getting out of the, the, the Metro Valley area. Litchfield Park, Chino Valley is being represented. Flagstaff, at least someone's temporarily in Flagstaff. Um, Scottsdale, um, but they're listening. It looks like they're listening um, in Clovis, California, but they're normally from Scottsdale. Camp Collie, Happy Jack area. Uh, Tempe is being represented. Sholo, Sun City. Peoria being represented. So good. We have a lot of, of, of representation around the state. Mostly it looks like everybody, at least everybody that's put in has said they're from the state. We have had some participants from across the, the country and even from the world in the last few. So good. All right. So let me do some quick introductions. Uh, if you're not familiar with who we are, this webinar is being hosted by the Arizona Game and Fish Department. We are a state government agency that is responsible for managing all of Arizona's wildlife. So there's more than 800 species of wildlife that we're responsible for managing and making sure that those populations continue now and into the future for future generations to enjoy. We are not your typical government agency in that we do not take general taxpayer dollars. So there's nothing from, our sale, from your sales tax, nothing from your income tax that comes to us as a government agency we operate much more on what we call a business model or a user pay model so it is the users of the resource that are the ones that are paying for it that's where things like hunting and fishing licenses come in when you buy a hunting license or you buy a fishing license that money comes directly to the to the department for the management of those species my name is Eric Proctor, and I'm the Wildlife Education Coordinator for the Arizona Game and Fish Department. In that role, I do these types of things. I work in the K-12 environment, um, the formal classroom environment, but you don't see me in classrooms too much. You don't see anybody in classrooms right now. But even when, when, when we do return to some sort of normal, um, I still don't go into classrooms a lot. Mostly what I do is work behind the scenes. I work with you guys as educators. So my role is to provide you with the resources um, to bring wildlife concepts and wildlife issues into your classroom, into your museum, into your park, whatever that might be. I'm here to support you so that we can get the message of wildlife out into the world. I am a former middle school science teacher. I taught seventh grade science in both the Littleton School District and in the Kyrene School District, both here in the Phoenix metro area. Um, I've also been involved in non-formal education for a number of years. I've been, I've worked at the Phoenix Zoo. I've worked at the um, Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum. I've worked at the Challenger Space Center. So all told, I've been involved in science education for more than 20 years. Um, but that's enough about all this stuff. Let's go ahead and get started into our, our presentation for a little bit. We are here to talk about mammals. So let's do that. Mammals are a group that includes humans. They are warm-blooded animals with vertebrates or backbones. All mammals share at least three characteristics not found in other animals. They have three middle ear bones, they have hair and they're the and they have the production of milk by modified sweat glands called mammary glands. All mammals have hair at some point during their development and most hair most have hair their entire lives. Adults of some species lose most or all of their hair, but even in mammals like whales and dolphins, hair is present at least during some phase of development. Mammalian hair serves at least four functions. First, it helps with insulation, keeping the animal warm or cool as appropriate. Second, specialized hairs, sometimes called whiskers, have a sensory function, letting an animal know when it's 
contact with an object in its environment. Think of like your cats that have little whiskers near their noses. Third, hair affects appearance through its color and pattern, helping to camouflage predators or prey, as well as signal to predators a defensive um, to sig a, a defensive mechanism. For example, the conspicuous color pattern of a skunk is a warning to predators. Hair also communicates social information. For example, threats such as erect hair on the back of a wolf or sex such as the different colors of male and female capuchin monkeys or the presence of danger such as the white underside of the tail of a white-tailed deer. Finally, hair protection simply by providing additional protective load against abrasion or sunburn, for example, or by taking on the form of dangerous spines that deter predators. Think about porcupines. And again, as I go through this, some of this is going to be review for some of you. We're going to try to integrate all this into, into, into a cool presentation. If you have any questions at all, feel free to add them into either of those comment boxes that, that, we've, that we've already talked about here. All female mammals produce milk from their mammary glands in order to nourish newborn offspring. Thus, female mammals invest a deal of energy caring for each of their offspring which has important ramifications in mammalian evolution, ecology, and behavior. Mammals are, one, are among the most adaptable animals on the planet. They are found on every continent and in every ocean. Different species of mammals have evolved to live in nearly all terrestrial and aquatic habitats on Earth. Mammals inhabit every terrestrial biome, from deserts to tropical rainforests to polar ice caps. Many species are arboreal, spending most or all of their time in the canopy forest. One reason for their success is the way they move. Mammals as a group use every possible form of locomotion. Terrestrial species walk, jump, run, climb, hop, swing, dig, and burrow. Aquatic ones swim, shuffle, and dive. One group, bats, has even evolved powered flight, only the third time that this ability has evolved in vertebrates, the other two groups being birds and the extinct pterosaurs. They have a tremendous range in size. Blue whales are the largest animals ever known to have lived on Earth. These magnificent marine mammals rule the oceans at up to 100 feet long and upwards of 200 ton tons, or about the size of 33 elephants. Their tongues alone can weigh as much as a single elephant. Their heart is the size of a Volkswagen Beetle and weighs just as much. Its stomach can hold one ton of krill, its primary food, and it needs to eat about four tons of krill each day. They are the loudest animals on earth and are even louder than a jet engine. Their calls reach 188 decibels while a jet reaches 140 decibels, give or take. Their low frequency whistle can be heard for hundreds of miles and is probably used to attract other blue whales. On the opposite end of the size spectrum are two animals, and it depends really on how you measure size. Kitty's hognose bat, or otherwise known as the bumblebee bat, is the smallest mammal by length at just over an inch. The Etruscan shrew is slightly longer than the bumblebee bat, however, but it's nearly half the weight of that bat at just over one gram. So depending on how you're measuring size, this is what the winners are gonna be. So this leads to our first activity idea. Since this is a webinar designed specifically for educators, not only will we be providing all sorts of natural history about mammals, but we will also be including opportunities to bring these concepts back to your specific te teaching situation. So I'm gonna share with you a lesson that actually originated from um, a, a popular educational program out there called uh, Project Wild, and this one's called Whale of a Tail, and it's introduced to, to teach, to give students an idea of size, and it also integrates some other subjects in there. Um, they practice scale drawing, so in the purpose of this one, what they do is they start by by taking a, a small piece of graph paper. You could have it be a one-inch graph paper or one cemented, centimeter graph paper. It depends on what, what level you're working at, and they draw their hand. They, they trace their hand across that graph paper. Then the idea is you want them to learn how to scale that drawing up, and so now you take larger paper um like 10 10 inches long um you set up a much larger paper this could be with poster paper or 
of paper or it could be on a, a grid that's established on a on a concrete floor on your wall or whatever it might be and they're supposed to learn how to take that smaller drawing and scale it up to to basically be 10 times as large okay so that's what that's what they get practice on and then what you do is they do some research on the size of whales this one focuses on whales we actually have um, an adaptation ver a different version that includes some of the terrestrial mammals so you can do this with elk and bison and some other animals as well but the, the original activity focused on whales and the idea now is that they draw a picture of a, of a whale again at a smaller scale so uh, where one one box might represent um, 10 feet for example and then they're supposed to scale that up and so they're going to draw and you can do this again on a large patio or out on the uh, multi-purpose room floor um you could use chalk whatever it might be but the idea now they can draw these life-size drawings do it through the scaling pattern so they get to get some uh, math and some science some math involved in there as well while they're uh, learning about how big some of these animals are again this is an activity that you're going to have access to at the end you're going to get a link the whole um, lesson plan is provided to you and that one's from um, a, an organization called Project Wild that has a number of educational activities. Mammals are typically characterized by their highly defined differentiated teeth. They can have four different types of teeth in a single mouth. Also, their teeth are replaced just once during a mammal's life, which is somewhat unusual when we, when we look at some of the other teethed animals. And for most mammals, their lower jaw is made up of a single bone. You can see it there on the, on the, the, the jawbone on the right. Um, it's one complete single bone is, is the lower jaw of a mammal. Um, as we study mammal skulls, we see that it can be an opportunity for us to help identify the animals. Their unique skulls can tell us about their evolutionary past. For example, all felines, who are closely related to each other, all have similar looking skulls, and they look different than canine skulls. You can look at the skull of a common house cat, and it would look more like a mountain lion than it would your pet dog because of the close relationship to them. You can see the examples there on the left-hand side. On the, the one on the top is a bobcat skull, and the one on the bottom is a coyote skull. And you can see how long, how different they are. This can then, of course, tell you a, lot, a little bit about um, the senses that are important, wh what are the different adaptations that are important for this particular animal. When you look at the bobcat skull, you can see the eye, the, the orbit, which is where the eye would go in, um, is very large in comparison to the skull, where on the coyote, it's a little bit smaller. Cats rely much more on their eyesight than they do on on some of their other um, senses so their eyes are bigger um, same with the, the when you look at the nose so dogs tend to have really long elongated snout because they rely much more on their sense of snip smell cats don't rely on their sense of smell much at least tradition their traditional sense of smell through their nose so they have a much more rounded skull their nose is not as enlarged or, or as elongated so you can start to see that now you can start to see where their similarities are um, of course this is another Great spot to highlight another activity that's available to you. And we actually have it in a couple different versions, depending on where you end up being next year and what your situation is or what the teaching situation ends up being. Um, we have a investigator activity. Um, the most popular way to get this has been through our bone boxes. Now, if you're not familiar, our bone boxes are a box that you can check out from one of our uh, through locations around the state, whether it's one of our regional offices or some of our partner organizations, like some of the parks that we've that we've partnered with. And inside the bone box are the skins and skulls of about of like 10 common Arizona mammals. So it allows you to bring the skulls into your classroom. And what's cool about that then is you can you can actually show them the features that we just talked about, those two skulls that you saw. They can look at the cat skull, they can look at the dog skull, they can try to identify them. We also have a digital learning activity. For, so when, when the school shut down back in March, obviously the bone boxes weren't just practical. People couldn't get them. Then there's cleaning concerns with the virus and all these different things. And so we created a digital one where your students could access at home. Um, while they're learning from home and then there's also a worksheet version what i want to do is i'm going to share just show you a quick look at the digital learning one um, i'm going to click on this link if you'll do me a favor and if you i because i want to make sure i can't see what you can see if you can just put me in the in the chat box if you can actually see did it switch over to say digital learning activities can you actually see that on the screen now okay good so a couple of people have said yes good I, I like to make sure that you can see this. so this is the page where these digital learning activities are found and there's a couple different ones so there's one on bats there's migrations there's symbiotic relations with tortoise research and i'm going to be adding to these as well um, but here's the skull investigator one so when you click on the skull investigator one um, it's basically an interactive google form and so they can go through it and 
Um, same thing. So what they start to do is it starts, they get some information. We're not going to go through this whole thing. You can do this on your own. But the idea is um, they get some information and they have to say, okay, after looking at the skulls, which one do you think belongs to a canine? So we've already answered that question because we had it earlier, but you would sit there and say, oh, I think skull A is um, belongs to the canine. So they would click on it. It says that they're right. And they continue through. And that what they'll do is they'll, they'll look for similarities between these two skulls. And then they're going to be given a mystery skull that they have to try to identify. And so that is just one example of, of something you could do at home. Then there's a worksheet version of this was that was actually part of our magazine. If you're not aware, the department publishes a magazine every two months. And a, a, a few years ago, they had me put educational activities into that magazine as well. And one of those was this activity, just kind of like almost in a worksheet version. So there's a couple different forms that you could access this mammalian skull investigator activity and so i just wanted to um sorry okay so here we are we're back to this part good all right diet and behavior vary for mammals as well Many carnivores, for example, are top predators that live generally solitary lives. These include jaguars, tigers, and polar bears. By contrast, lions, wolves, dolphins, and otters live in family groups. Even more social are some of the herbivores, especially hoofed animals like deer and zebra. By living in large groups, they, they gain both protection against becoming another animal's meal and more opportunities to breed. Rodents in particular are well known for their capacity to reproduce in high numbers. All of these lead to one more activity focused on mammal biology. This one looks at lifespans. And so I'm going to show you one more general activity, and then we're going to, the, we're going to go look um, at kind of the conservation and, and the, the status of mammals around the world for a little bit. In this activity, which is um, basically charting mammal lifespans, uh, this is designed for an elementary audience. So this one's a little bit younger. You could do this one probably as young as about uh, second grade. It used to incorporate the old standards. I haven't had a chance to align it to the newly adopted science standards. Uh, but the idea of this one is that uh, students, first of all, you give them some pictures of some animals. And so you, you would use one of the animals on this chart. Don't show them the chart yet, but you would give them uh, um, some it, some pictures of the animals and their their first job is to estimate how long they think that animal lives and so they might get a picture of a mountain lion and they have to think okay how long do i think a mountain lion lives and so they write the number on a sticky note that can go onto the picture or anything like that and then you have the kids uh, line themselves up in order of lifespan right again if you're thinking about this from a second grade audience you're looking at some very basic general general math skills that you're trying to do ordering and things like that so they would line up in order of their estimates so if they think that the mountain lion lives five years but the elk lives 10 years they're going to line up accordingly in the classroom based on that and then you can share with them the actual information you could have those on charts you could have them on the back of the animal card that they're looking at whatever it might be and so they have to to run some comparisons how far off were they so you know what you know which you know how far were they from the 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 estimate was their estimate from the original um the actual lifespan um they could reorder based on the new um thing and then they could also calculate range what is the range of the lifespans of these different animals and so you're, you're incorporating a bunch of different math skills that are in there and then what you do is you ask them you have them start to look at this table so you can put this table up on a, on a projector on a screen whatever it might be and then you them start to think are are there questions that develop from just looking at this looking at this chart and so i'm going to give you some examples of some that i've seen students do in the past just just as an example um so what you what i would do is brainstorm in the classroom okay well what, what are some questions that arise and so maybe one of those questions your students might ask is um do closely related animals such as coyotes and foxes those those are those are both canines or bobcats and mountain lions those are both felines do they have similar lifespans and so that's a question that they could legitimately try to try to answer using this chart and maybe some of their own research another question might be why do two different rabbits jackrabbit and cottontail have such different lifespans if you look at our chart there um the 
the jackrabbit has a, um, a lifespan of 13 years, while the cottontail only has a one to two year range. So they might be curious about, well, gee, I wonder what's different about these about these creatures and why they would have such a, a, a disparity in their in their ages. And so then you allow them to do some research, but ultimately the idea is that they would create a pic that they have to create a pictograph because um, that was one of the standards at second grade for, for this, but they could create any type of graph based on, on the standards that you were addressing. In this case, I had them create a pictograph um, looking at lifespan and, and some other different things. And then they have to try to answer that question maybe with some research and, and some things like that. And so this is an idea, an activity that you can incorporate some basic math skills, some basic graphing skills, and the beginnings of a scientific investigation um, all by incorporating and centering around these this diversity that we see in mammals. So that just another activity. I'm going to go ahead and um, move on here in just a minute. But again, if you have any questions, feel free to get them into the into the chat feature. To fully understand this incredible mammal diversity, we need to look at their evolution. Although they came into their own only after the extinction of the dinosaurs some 65 million years ago, mammals had maintained a low profile existence for some 150 million years before that. New fossil discoveries, um, relatively new, reveal more of this early history every year. In 2001, researchers reported that a fossil found in China in 1985 is the remains of a tiny furry animal that was a relative of the living mammals today, but lived 195 million years ago in the early Jurassic period. Called, Hadr call, called Hadracodium, the little creature had certain key mammalian features 40 million years earlier than had previously been known from the fossil record. Descended from more archaic relatives, the early true mammals were mainly small insect-eating creatures adapted to nighttime activity. They ranged in size from scarcely bigger than a bumblebee to squirrel-sized, keeping out of the way of those larger predatory dinosaurs. They acquired certain traits that would characterize mammals ever afterward. These including limbs positioned under the body, an enlarged brain, a more complex physiology, milk producing glands, and a diverse array of teeth, incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. Already present were the ancestors of the three major mammalian groups that exist today. The monotremes, which is the platypus and the spiny anteater, which lay their eggs externally. Marsupials kangaroos and opossums, which carry their young in a pouch, and placental mammals, humans, cows, horses, the rest of the mammals we think of, which retain the fetus internally during, long, during, during a long gestation period. In the early Cenozoic era, after the dinosaurs became extinct, the number and diversity of mammals exploded. In just 10 million years, a brief flash of time by geologic standards, about 130 gen genera or groups of related species has e had evolved, encompassing some 4,000 species. So they went from basically tiny little insect-eating mammals to, to blowing up to more than 4,000 species. These included the first fully aquatic mammals, which were whales, and the first flying mammals, bats, as well as rodents and primates all started to evolve during this time frame. The sudden expansion of species diversity into new ways of life is known as adaptive radiation. One way it occurs is in response to events that free up previously occupied niches or environmental zones and roles, making way for many new species that adapt to these vacant living spaces. Remember that whole thing, nature pours a vacuum? So if, if a species gets removed, it doesn't usually take long before another species moves in and fills in that, that role. The extinction of the dinosaurs was one such major event, eliminating a once dominant group of competitors while some mammals survived. But the mammals did not simply step into ecological roles vacated by the dinosaurs. It took several million years for the mammals to evolve even moderately large body sizes, and the world they inherited was a very different place from the one the dinosaurs had dominated. There were new environmental habitats and new food resources to exploit. By the end of the Cretaceous, flowering plants had become dominant, providing food for burgeoning populations of insects, which in turn became another high-quality food source for mammals, along with fruits and berries. New kinds of forests appeared, offering novel habitats for what would become tree-dwelling mammals, primates, which first appeared about 50 million years ago, and eventually some 45 million years later, upright walking hominids, including us. The astonishing diversity of mammalian species today stems in part from the continuing breakup of the continents that, became some 200, that began some 200 million years ago and sent different land masses moving apart. Australia and South America were isolated from other continents during much of the tertiary, 
and marsupial mammals thrived and diversified there, while placental mammals took over similar roles on the other continents. Mammals have evolved to inhabit the marine environment on multiple independent occasions. Whales, dolphins, and porpoises, and then another group, manatees and dugongs, emerged during the Eocene period, the epoch. Pinnipeds, which include seals, sea lions, and walruses, emerged approximately 20 years after those groups during the Miocene, um, along with the carnivore group. These groups are an excellent example of what we call convergent evolution, or the idea that organisms that are not closely related evolve similar traits independently. If we look at dolphins and whales, which are related to each other, and we look at manatees and dugongs, which are related, but not that closely related to whales and dolphins, as you can see on the, on the, the chart, um, and then we look at walruses and seals and those types of things, you can see they're separated quite a bit on the evolutionary chart. Um, but they share a number of physical adaptations that allow them to move and sense in an aquatic world, um, but they develop them at different times. So they didn't, they, they don't have those traits because they're closely related to each other. They have them because they were fulfilling similar roles, but they were different species altogether. This actually came from a, a research study that was, that was looking at um, the, how close the, the, the genomes of green mammals, you can see that the, they came up with the reds and the black but it wasn't relevant entirely to the present it's like because it did kind of show you that animals that they're not next to each other not all that closely related they're in fact whales and dolphins are more closely related to cows and um, and then walruses are more closely related to dogs and horses and then the manatees are closely related to elephants so you can see where those groups of, of animals kind of separate out a little bit This evolutionary history has led to a tremendous diversity in the number of mammal species. Scientists have identified nearly 6,000 species of mammals on Earth. In the United States, we have more than 400. This one shows um, uh, the 359 that this particular organization had um, range maps for. And so the, the redder it gets, the, the more biodiversity is in that particular area. So the more mammals that are in that particular area. So this is looking see Arizona right there, right in the heart of, of that, that bright red area. We have tremendous mammal diversity specific in the, in the, in the southeastern part of the state. These maps show some recognizable mammalian orders and their diversity across the globe. So you have carn our carnivora, which is which is a lot of our you know the, the dogs and cats and, and uh, um, others that are in there. You have the primates. You have the chiroptera, which is your bats. You have rodents up in the upper right-hand corner, and you have marsupials. There are other orders. I just picked some of the recognizable ones. Um, take a moment to look at these maps. Does anything stand out? Is there any kind of trend that you notice, anything um, that you kind of notice there? There isn't a right answer for this. I'm not looking for a specific answer. I was just curious if, if as you look at these maps, if there's anything that strikes you. While you're doing that, I'm going to take a look and make sure there have, have any questions um, that are coming out here a little bit. Um, so Jim asks, asks, why do you think there's more diversity in the Southwest? Um, and it's a good question. There's probably a, a number of different factors. Um, a lot of it is going to be that that South, especially that Southeastern part of the state, um, is, is a number of different habitat types that are coming together and merging together. So you have kind of the Sonoran Desert matching up with the Chihuahuan Desert. Um, both have their own um, water patterns, their own type of, they're very specific habitats, so they're going to come with their own species as well. And then mixed in with all of that, you have the Sky Islands. So you have these, the basin and range habitats where the deserts are down below, but you have all these mountains, these tall mountains in between these deserts and mixed in with these deserts. And those essentially serve as islands that the animals can't, the animals can't get from one mountain to another mountain because they've got desert between, a very different habitat. And so all of these different types of habitats in one particular area has led to a lot of, um, a lot of diversity. Good. So let's see what some of the um, kind of trends or things that you're noticing coming out of these maps. Somebody said that the primates tend to be tropical. Most definitely, they don't they don't hit the northern hemisphere very much. You know, they, they do get south a little bit on the areas that are south, but the primates tend to be tropical. 
Um, the lack of marsupials in the old world, absolutely. They tend to be basically in Australia and South America, and then a couple species of possums that come up into to North America. But marsupials, for the most part, are, and that he has to deal with the, remember, the tectonic plates. And when, when South America and Australia split off, and they were so isolated for so long, species evolved um, there without having a lot of interaction with the rest of the world. Um, some types of mammals are not present on some types of continents, absolutely. And then uh, rodents are found worldwide. They're, they are literally everywhere. Uh, marsupials, not much species in the Western region. You can see some in the coastal West. Um, carnivore and rodents seem to be the most widespread. Bats might need a humid tropical area. So we have um, there. And then I thought there would be more mammal diversity at the poles. Um, so what's interesting here, and, and I should point this out. So Jenny asked that. That's a good question. What we're not seeing in a lot of this is um, a lot of these aren't the aquatic ones. And so if we were to look at marine mammal diversity, and you're going to see that in a minute. That's either the next slide or coming up here pretty soon. Um, that's going to look a little different because that's actually going to be in the oceans. And so that's going to be a little different. But still, it may surprise you a little bit. Of course, no mammals in Antarctica, on at least for that are represented here. On these ones those are going to be much more represented on the marine um, level as well so according collected and analyzed by the international union for conservation of nature or what we're going to call the iucn an organization that is devoted to understanding the status of nature and how to conserve it about one fifth or about 20 percent of all mammals are known to be threatened or extinct in this graph, and this is a graph that I made, um, but I made it using data that's freely available from the IUCN's website. Um, I'm comparing the percentage of threatened species across different animal groups. You can see that mammals are second only to amphibians as a group of conservation concern. And when they use the term threatened, they're actually talking about, so they, the IUCN has, has very specific classifications for different animals, and it, it correlates somewhat to our Endangered Species Act, but it's not the same. I, I, IUCN is an international organization, um, so they have, a, they have um, a variety of classifications of animals. And when they use the term threatened, they're basically talking about three classifications of animal, critically endangered, endangered, or vulnerable. And so those are the three classifications that they then describe as threatened. And so these are of those animals that fit those three classifications, according to them, um, about a little over 20% of mammals are reach that classification. And that is the, the second highest only to amphibians as far as which animals are, are most threatened on earth. So this is another graph. Um, that I collected. Um, now, this is looking at just mammals. And what I decided to do was look and say, well, well, what types of mammals are the most threatened? And so they break it down by order. So this is by order. And this, so this is similar to the maps that I showed you before, where it showed chiroptera and um, marsupial, all that stuff. We've broken it down by order of um, mammal. And you can, the ones that are in red, are the ones that have over 50% of their species that are threatened. And there are six orders that fall into that break. And so I'm going to read off those ones because you might not be able to recognize what all of those are. Some of them are pretty obvious, like primate. We kind of identify what a primate is. Um, but some of these, you might not know what they are. Um, I don't know what all of these are. So if you ask me on one of the blue ones, I'm not necessarily going to be able to identify it unless I was to look it up. Um, but but the ones that, are, that, that have over 50% of their species that are threatened um, include uh, the the monotremata, which is the duck-billed platypus and some of those types of species. Um, there is the par perisodactyl, which are the odd-toed ungulates, which includes species like horses and tapirs and rhinos. Um, doesn't mean that all those species in there, again, these are these are orders that have over 50%. Um, the, the philodota, which is the pangolins. We hear a lot about pangolins. There's a lot of um, social media stuff being done on pangolins. Um, the primates, of course, which are apes. Uh, the proboscidea, which the only living members of those are elephants, but this also used to include mammoths and mastodons and, and things like that. And then the uh, sirenia, which are the manatees and the dugongs. These are the six orders of animals that have them that are the most threatened on Earth. So what do these threats look like globally? And this is the map that I was referring Jenny to. Um, we have two different sets of maps here. On the left-hand side is marine mammal diversity. That's why all the colors are in the water. And on the right-hand side is the, the, the terrestrial, basically, 
uh, mammal diversity or mammal richness. And this is coming, it comes from biodiversity mapping, but the data is coming from the same organization that IUCN that I've been citing earlier. So the top part is the general diversity, and then the bottom graphs are the threatened. Where, where are those threatened species? Um, do you notice any patterns as you, as you look at this, just like the, the maps before? Just take a minute and look at these and see if there's anything that pops out at you. Again, not necessarily a right or wrong answer. I'm just curious what you see when you look at these maps. So for, for clarification, if you can't read them, um, red in all the cases is more diversity or more species. So when you see it, the hotter it is, that means there's more, either more diversity or that there's more threatened species in that particular area. So let's see what we have going on here. Greatest diversity is closest to the equator. That was from earlier. Um, greater concentration at uh, the, uh, the equator. Uh, marine mammal diversity is higher near the coast. Absolutely, um, because again, marine mammals are not fish, right? So marine mammals are still lung breathing, so they still have to rely on air. So they have to go to places where they're going to be able to get up on land or be able to get out into the air. So that's probably not too surprising that you're going to see more diversity along the coasts in the water. Um, <laughs> look how many uh, threatened mammals there are um, in in the northern hemisphere. Absolutely. Um, has some certain areas. It looks like uh, Southeast Asia. That there's a very high, high level in there. Um, what I noticed when I looked in there is um, marine mammal diversity was the highest in the middle around the equatorial area, but the threatened was up north in those northern seas. I'm going to contribute. This is pure speculation on my part. That's probably due to all the whaling um, efforts that we went to in the early part of the century in the, in the 1800s and the 1900s, not this century, I guess the 1800s and 1900s. Um, all the efforts that went into whaling for oil and baleen um, and all that type of stuff, I'm going to guess that that's what caused, and that a lot of that was a lot of those Arctic ones. Um, that, that we went into. So I'm going to guess that that has something to do with it. Their coastal fishing might have an impact. The melting of the polar ice caps might have an impact. Absolutely. Um, so just kind of some interesting graphs to, to kind of illustrate kind of what this mammal problem is, because we can say that there's problems. We're concerned about mammals. One fifth of them are, are in danger of going extinct. But what does that mean? It doesn't mean that it's everywhere. Um, it's just kind of... Um, all right, so here's another set of maps. It shows a very similar thing. Um, in this case, the focus is just on endemic species, which are those mammals that are found nowhere else in the world. Um, not surprisingly, the areas with the highest endemic mammal diversity are also the places with the most species in jeopardy. Basically what these ones are showing a little bit. All right, so what can we do about it? What type of management strategies are we implementing to help out mammals? I'd like to talk about two of them that are used here in Arizona. They're used elsewhere as well, but I'm going to talk about two that they are specific to Arizona. Um, to introduce them, however, we're going to flip the, the script a little bit. Rather than talk about the management and then share an educational activity, I'm going to share the activity first, and then we'll talk about the concept behind it. In our first one, we're going to look at the issue of bottlenecking, which occurs when we have too few of a species and we risk things like inbreeding which can cause major genetic issues. And one of the best examples of this that we've had in recent times is the, is the black-footed ferret. If you're not aware, the black-footed ferret is largely considered one of, one of the most endangered mammals in the world. Um, it's been declared extinct twice. We've thought it's been extinct twice. Um, we just so happen to find some small populations of them that, that have come up. And so what we've done is we made the decision to take them out of the wild. Um, and then enter them into a captive breeding program. And the reason we chose to do that is twofold. One, if you've only got one population and only consists of like 10 individuals, let's say, um, and something goes through that population, something like plague or a disease or habitat, some, something changes, you risk losing that entire population and risk losing everything that you have. The other thing is it helps us get a better control of the genetics. And this is where the bottlenecking comes in. And the idea of bottlenecking is you have such a few amount of individuals to, to build a population from that you have that inbreeding and the, the issues that come around with inbreeding and the lack of genetic diversity becomes a significant risk. And so um, in this case, what your students do is you're going to represent this through a simulation. 
And so you're going to use colored beads. And I like to put the colored beads in like a soda bottle to, again, have, have another analogy towards that bottlenecking concept. So you put a whole bunch of different colored beads, and you can see the colors that I use in here, um, into a, a, a soda bottle. And then you, you distribute those beads to groups of students. Each group gets 14 random beads. Now, this also is, is, is simulating the ferret population. It's not 100% correlation, just like any simulation that we're going to do in a classroom. It's not 100%. But the for, the reason 14 was chosen is because there were, when all was said and done with the ferrets, there were basically seven breeding individuals. There were a few other individuals, but they 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 didn't really work as as an increase in the population. So there were basically seven breeding individuals, and so that's the population you're working with is the is the amount that can breed. And so if you assume that each one has two copies of the gene, you have 14 genes that you're dealing with um, in here. So you're going to pour 14 genes out into each group's bowl or or on their table or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. They don't have to get all the colors. In fact, it works better if they don't get all the colors because that illustrates the point. If you're only dealing with 14 genes, you may be lacking some of these things. And again, simulation is 100%. This isn't entirely how genes work, but, but the simulation is, is close enough. And so you can see here that if they get yellow, that means that their population has has uh, the genes available to camouflage. If they get black beads, that means they're they're population gets the ability for precise vision, orange is an accurate sense of smell, and so on. I'm not going to go through these. Now, let's say I'm a student group, and I've just gotten my beads, and at the end of getting my 14 beads, these are the, the, the traits that I have in my population. So the red is, is marked. So I have camouflage, I have healthy jaw formation, I have speed and agility, and then I have acute hearing. Those other traits, they don't exist in my population. Those genes aren't there. So now what you do is you give the student um, a scenario. And there are a number of scenarios that are presented in this lesson. I'm going to show you one. And what I'd like you to do is read the scenario, and then you tell me after a year, how likely is it that this population would survive based on the genes that they have and the situation they're facing? So here's the situation. Humans are building homes about 10 miles away, and they wiped out a prairie dog colony. So prairie dogs rely on our ferrets rely almost exclusively on prairie dogs for food. Um, so can your population survive when black-footed ferrets from that colony that was just destroyed invade your territory for food? Okay, so look at the traits that you have available in your population, and you tell me, after about a year, would our population of ferrets, would, would we, is it reasonable to assume that they may still be there? Or are they going to get wiped out based on the characteristics they have? So just kind of put your thoughts on into the, into the chat a little bit and tell me what you think again. Not necessarily a right or wrong answer. This is where the critical thinking for your students comes in. What do you guys think? Are we gonna do do you think this population might fare okay when when we're attacked by another group of of ferrets? Or are we gonna struggle a little bit? We have some answers coming in. Somebody says um, we don't have a healthy rate of reproduction, so that could be a problem. So when we get when we get ferrets that are killed, we're not going to be able to replace them as as steadily. Um, they're probably going to struggle. They might have to relocate. We do have speed and agility, so that might help us in the relocation. Is that we could we could run off and try to find a new home potentially. So it is up in the air. We we don't know 100%, and that that's the, that's the issue. But um, but that's kind of what we're looking at is, the, again, the student's critical thing. I'm going to give you one more example. We're going to keep the same genes in place, but I'm going to go ahead and um, give you another example here. So drought causes the prairie soil to compact and harden. Does your pop population of strong legs to dig and adapt the burrows that they steal from their prairie dog prey to make their home? So drought is drying up the soil, making it much more hard and compact. Are we going to be able to create and, and live in that soil based on the adaptations that we have? We know that we're missing the strong claws, um, so that's going to be challenging. We might be able to, to supplement with something else, um, so but we're going to have trouble trouble digging as necessary. Ferrets don't do a lot of digging; they they rely on stealing homes from prairie dogs, um, but they they do need to modify their their homes a little bit to make them suitable. So this one might struggle a little bit because of lacking those strong arms and claws, strong claws, claws and forearms. So again, this is an activity that's available to you. Um, it's going to be on that that website at the end. There there's a lot more to it. We're just giving you a very simple one, but it's a kind of a fun one that you can do. Um, and what's cool about it is each of the groups is going to be different. And so there's a couple different ways you can do it. You could have each group get their own thing or you can have them all get their their genes and then you as a class are dealing with one particular issue 
and um, they have to determine if their population would survive based on on that. Or you can give them each separate issues that they have to, to deal with. It kind of depends on how you how you want to do it. Um, so what is it? How do what does this mean for us? How do we deal with this? So there is this thing called um, a stud book, and there's other management to this, but. Um, under the species survival plan, so when a species becomes endangered and they enter into a species survival plan, um, working with zoos and aquariums, this is this is a zoo and aquarium program, what happens is they, they become a stud book. And the stud book basically means that there's one zoo or there's one individual who oversees the genetics of a particular species. And so the stud book for black-footed ferrets is held at a particular facility. The stud book for Mexican gray wolves is held at a particular facility. And there's one person or, or a group of individuals that's kind of responsible responsible for that. And the idea, and you can see the purpose, this is pulled from the stud book regional uh, keeper handbook. And this is the purpose that they put on here. The purpose of an association uh, regional stud book is to document the pedigree and history of each animal in order to create a breeding and transfer plan. So the idea is we're, the stud book just tracks which of the animals we have in captivity are related to each other. And how related are they? Because sometimes they're going to be all be related. And the question is, how related are they? And so we use the stud book then to determine if we if we need to continue breeding them, if they're in a captive breeding program. This is why we start moving animals around. If you've ever been to the zoo and you, you fell in love with a, a favorite elephant or a favorite tortoise or whatever it might be, and then that, that animal got shipped to another zoo, it's because of this. What they're doing is they know the genetics of that particular animal, and they know the genetics of at a, the animal at a different zoo, and the idea is okay these ones are far enough apart we think that they have traits that are going to be that are going to complement each other let's put them together and see if we can get them to breed so we're tracking that they're not going to be continuing to breed um with close family members as much as possible and so that's why these animals get transferred between zoos and things like that so that's one of the ways that we're working on dealing with bottlenecking let's look at real quickly because we are uh, quickly starting to run out of time here um, another one is um, an activity that, that we've developed called I'm a wolf biologist and in this case students are going to read an article about how we track wolves and it's a very short little you know four or five page article you can see the article here it actually came out of our magazine um, once they do that then they're going to get they're going to understand like some of the techniques we use how do we use helicopters how do we use airplanes how do we use um, um, telemetry radio callers, those types of things, and, and you know, gets gets to the science behind that. So the students are going to understand what that works. And then they become a, a wolf technician and they're going to analyze data. And so what they do is we give them location data from those radio callers that we use, and then they, 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 they have to plot them. So you give them two different types of maps. You give them an, an aerial view map and a topographical map, and they have to plot the locations of that wolf based on radio collars. Where was that wolf found? They get to do things like describe the habitat of the wolf, uh, of this particular wolf, and so on, and um, make all sorts of conclusions, and then they can compare it to, to modern day. Um, but it's getting at the tracking of the wolves and how do we use these things like uh, radio collars to, to get at it. Um, very simple activity, um, but how does this relate to the real world? So you can go onto our website and there's a, there's a whole Mexican wolf conservation piece. You can see the website down there. Again, you'll have access to some of this stuff, but I'm gonna show you the wolf telemetry map. So every few weeks, our wolf biologists go up in an airplane and they, they all of our wolves have collars on them, or at least many of the wolves have collars on them. We don't always put them on every animal because wolves are pack animals. You get collars on one or two of the individuals in the pack. You don't necessarily collar all of them the pack tends to stay together. Um, so we fly over the wolf the wolf area and we try to identify where all the wolves are, are, are located. And that turns into a map just like this. And I'm gonna assume just like before that you'll be able to see this map once it pulls up. Um, so I, all I did was this came directly off of our website. This is a live map, um, meaning that the data is in and that you can actually move it. Um, they explain everything over here. So the, the orange dots are where the wolves were located. It's not an exact location. We don't pinpoint it was found on this, this particular location. It's a 2000 acre hexagon that we put them in and the wolf could have been anywhere inside that hexagon. Um, the blue area is sort of where the wolves have been. Um, where they have been at some point in the past, kind of their established territory. And then if you look at the white area, this is the entire reintroduction area of the wolves and all that's explained over there. But as you zoom into the map, you could actually go in and click on one of these hexagons and it'll give you information. It'll show you that this is from the Elkhorn pack and this was individual 1294 that was found there. And you notice it's, it's identified as stud book. So in the stud book, we would know the genetic information of this particular animal. 
Um, and so you can click on all these different ones and you can get this, but we get this information from those radio callers that they're going to read about in that article. And, the, and they're basically creating a, a non-technical and non-digital version of this map by using that data that was provided before. So, all right. So again, we're, I want to run pretty quickly. I've got a couple more activities I want to share with you, and then we're going to, we're going to move on here. If you're not familiar, a fun way to get involved in mammals is something called uh, March Mammal Madness. And it's, it's a tie-in with, um, it's not a tie-in. I shouldn't say it's a tie-in. It is inspired by the NCAA's March Madness, which is the big basketball tournament. And the idea of this is it pits two different, it pits mammals against each other in a, in a fictional fight basically if these two mammals were to encounter each other in the wild in a certain habitat who would win um so it's a fun little way to tie in with this it incorporates science it incorporates education there's a social media aspect they, they release the results on twitter it's a lot of fun and if you haven't been involved in this or done it i highly encourage you to look at doing it this coming year you can start getting involved in it right around february uh, but let's give you some so this is what they do they actually set up a bracket just like you do in march madness and you can see here in this case there are a couple more than just mammals they do have a couple birds in here as well but you can see what they do is they're pitting in each round there's two animals pitted against each other um so if i go over um and you can and they've got them into their different areas so if you, if you follow college basketball uh, you, you'll know there's an east to west and, and so on they've divided in their own things the tiny terrors the caddish versus the dogish so those are cat-like animals and dog-like animals. The tiny terrors are going to be smaller animals. Um, the double trouble, and then they have the anthro anthropocene. Um, and then each year, the, these change a little bit. They have other names for them. And then they, they run a whole little fictional tournament based on science, and they incorporate in the science in there, and they run on who would win if these two faced off against each other. And it goes through a whole bracket thing. There's a ton of fun to be involved with it. Um, this is an example. I don't expect you to read this whole thing, but this is this was the championship last in this most recent one in 2020. This was the championship, and it was a gorilla versus the brown hyena. So you can see they turn it into a whole like TV. like It's like it's a TV broadcast. Like These guys are... Are, are broadcasting the whole event. So it says, tonight's randomly selected battleground is coastal. This particular coastal area is in northern Queensland, Australia, where two world heritage ecosystems meet, the Daintree Rainforest and the Great Barrier Reef. Brown Coyote is pretty happy with this pick as he has adapted to Namibian coastal living and scavenging in intertidal zones. What I did was I highlighted some areas where they, they incorporate some of the science in there, where they talk about some of the adaptations that are being discussed. So just in this brief little paragraph, you can see that they're throwing in science in a fun little way. The, the brown Brown hyena raises its hair to appear larger. The gorilla prepares to charge. That's a behavioral adaptation it has. Then they throw in a, a crocodile in here. So the gorilla yells at the crocodile. And because the crocodile has sensitive hearing, he moves and slips away. And in the end, one winner comes out. And this year, the winner was the gorilla. And they actually do this whole little thing to, to tie it in. It's, it's really kind of funny. And they do different matchups each year. So the battle is going to be different um, each year. Um, and so that's March Mammal Madness. I encourage you, I think, and they have a whole, they have um, educator lessons with it. They give you access to a Google Drive where they throw in a whole bunch of stuff and activities and all kinds of stuff. I have all that stuff for 2020. So the most recent one we just did is in there, um, but they're going to, I'm sure they're going to do one for 2021. So I'm going to do a couple more. I've got two more activities. If you attended the, mam the amphibians one, these are going to be very similar because I like these activities. They tie in really well. And they also, there's a good overlap between doing these across other species. So I'm a big person on literacy, like combining language arts into science instruction. And so um, poetry is one of those ways. If you're not familiar with Douglas Florian, I highly encourage you to go check him out. Um, he writes these, these very simple and fun poetry books related on animals. Here's a couple of them. The one we're going to look at today is Mammal Mammalbilia, um, which is all about mammals. And so I'm going to give you some examples of his style. So this is a poem that's found inside Mammalbilia. He does the artwork to go along with it too. So this one was just on the coyote. And I'm, I'll read it. I prowl, I growl, my howl is throaty. I love a vowel for I am coyote. And you can see the little um, coyote thing there. Um, another one is the porcupine. You can see uh, he does a lot of shape poems. So the shape of his poem is, is indicative of what he's talking about, too. In this case, he's written the poem so that they look like the little porcupine quills. So the, for the porcupine, he wrote, the porcupine can climb up pine on bark and leaves. It loves to dine. The porcupine has porky pins that sprout out from its porky skin. And if you touch one, you'll complain. The porcupine's a porky pain. We'll just do one more for fun. This is the beaver, wood chopper, tree drop, hail flopper, stream stopper. 
So he does these fun little poems. And what I encourage you to do is have students do something similar, introduce them to Douglas Florian and those types of poems. And then at the end of your mammals unit, have the kids write a poem about a mammal or give them a fact sheet about an animal. And they have to take what they learn about the animal and turn it into a poem just like this. And they can do the artwork to go along with it. One more that I'm gonna show you, another one that's very simple that works as a good um, end of unit sort of um, assessment that you can do, a performance assessment is a six word memoir. And the idea of this one is they have to describe an animal or a mammal, but they can only use six words, no fewer and no more than six words. So I'm gonna give you some examples that have been done at some teacher workshops. This one was on bison, and you can see the six words that this particular teacher chose, roaming, herbivore, wallows, buffalo, grazer, herds. That's what they chose to describe a bison. Now, some people do them as entire sentences. Um, so here's a gray wolf, pack roaming, carnivorous, den-dwelling mammal. So they they wrote it as almost a descriptive sentence. And then you have the black-footed ferret was done at another one, at another workshop that I had. Underground mask nocturnal predator successfully recovering. Um, so another way that you can have students really think about concise, um, um, how to be concise in their writing is to, to tie in these six little things. And you can do this with mammals, you can do it with amphibians, you can do it with just about any type of animal um, that we'd be talking about. So really quickly, um, I just want to tell you we're almost done. However, before we sign off, I wanted to share some action items, some things that you can do to make a tangible difference in the lives of mammals in Arizona or wherever you may be. First, as educators, you are in a unique position. You have the opportunity to reach many, many people with your actions. Accept this role and use it. Continue to learn and then spread the word. Incorporate mammals into your instruction. Let's start talking about them. Let's start making them aware of the mammals and not just the big ones that are really like the megafauna that it was like all the different types of mammals tell people about the cool world of mammals um some other things that you can do um you can become a wildlife uh, you can become a hero for wildlife this is a relatively new program that there's on a game of fish has started if you go to that website azwildlifehero.com you can become a conservation member so you you contribute a short amount of i think the 30 dollars is one of the one of the things you can contribute um it gives you access to our magazine but that money comes directly towards the management of these types of species um you can obviously volunteer we have a lot of the department has a lot of projects you can also get involved with other what we call critter groups so there's the arizona elk society there's the prong the antelope um, foundation there's all these different associations that are out there that work with these mammals they do a lot of habitat improvement projects to make the habitat better for these um, we do ferret spotlighting every year usually um, it's been up in the air a little bit with the with the coronavirus type stuff but usually twice a year we do uh, ferret spotlighting where you can go out and try to find ferrets in the field um, don't feed wildlife. That's always a big one that, that we want to talk about is these are wild animals. If you feed them, especially large mammals like bears and, and things like that, it becomes problematic and those bears inevitably are probably going to have to get um, killed or, or lethally removed. And then, of course, things like disposing of waste properly. This is particularly, you know, litter does not do good for these animals. As part of feeding the wildlife, they think it's food, but also when we talk about our marine mammals and things like plastics and those types of things, making sure that we're disposing of our waste properly. These are things that we know we can make a difference in with, with wildlife wildlife. Um, with that, I would like to thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them into the chat or the Q&A box. I know there are some questions sitting in there, so I'm going to go back. While I wait for you to type in any questions, I'm going to talk about some upcoming workshops and next steps. If you need to run, I totally understand. You can log out and, and, and be done. Um, you should receive an email shortly with the link to your certificate. Um, but if you want to stick around, you want to hear about some of the other workshops that we have coming up, or you want to hear, or you have a question that you want to answer, that's great. Like I said, I'm going to give... Um, you a little bit of time to, to type it in a little bit um, for more information there, there's the link to the mammal resources i know you you that's a long link like i said it's going to be in that follow-up email so once you get the follow-up email you'll click on a link and it's going to provide you all kinds of information if you want to stay in touch with us we run a facebook page you can also sign up for our e-news we have a specific educator newsletter on on our e-news if you go to azgfd.com and you click on the button that says sign up for e-news put in your email and then you mark the, the educator box you're going to get email notifications from us on on when we have new workshops available and things like that we do have two more workshops currently scheduled and then we've got more that are in the planning phases so july and august is going to bring us even more workshops but for june we have two more scheduled the following two uh, wednesdays at 2 p.m the same time we're doing phenomenal fish next week and then awesome avians um, there's two ways that you can find the, the to register for them is right there again you're going to get a lot of this information coming up um, and then if you have any other questions or you don't get questions answered today or you don't have time or you need to run, um, there's my email. That's the best way to get in touch with me right now um, if you need to reach out. So with that, I'm going to review through here and see if there's any questions. 
um, that I need to answer or come through. Um, if you have questions, feel free to get them in. I'm probably gonna stick around for a few more minutes, but let me see. Robert, yes, I got your email. I was going to respond to you. I'm, I'm putting that together. You'll, you should get that um, by hopefully tomorrow. Suzanne asked, is there a list of critter groups on the website? That's a good question. There used to be, but I think since we updated our website, we, we did not. Um, we have not updated it. What I would do is if there's a specific animal, and this is going to sound bad, but if there's a particular animal that you that you are most interested in, you can always Google it. Um, I can tell you the, the big game species. So the elk have a group, the deer have a group, the pronghorn have a group, turkey, they're not, they're animals, but they have a group. Um, bighorn sheep have a group. Um, so they all have, they all have, a lot of those animals have groups. Some of the non-game species, the ones that you can't hunt, don't necessarily have a group. And it doesn't mean you have to hunt them to be in these groups, but they are largely some of the species that can be hunted. Um, but, and then you can go on our website and look at volunteer opportunities. I do know that that's changing a little bit. We've got some new volunteer policies that are going into effect, and hopefully that whole process is going to become a little bit easier. But um, getting onto those, once you're on a lot of our volunteer stuff, you're going to start getting emails on them. So once you volunteer for the ferrets, for example, a lot of times you'll get emails for the ferrets and, and things like that. Um, let's see. Just see if there's any more questions. So Valerie asked, do we do field trips to the wildlife center? Um, so at this point, no, we do not. And there's a couple reasons for that. One, we didn't do it before because our wildlife center. So if you're not familiar, Arizona Game and Fish does operate our own wildlife center. And so the wildlife center is like a wildlife rehabilitation facility, just like Liberty Wildlife and some of these other ones. In fact, we work with those other wildlife agencies a lot, um, those organizations. Um, but we have our own wildlife center. And up until a couple years ago or a year or so ago, um, that was the, the wildlife center was actually attached to the juvenile corrections facility. Um, and that was done on purpose as well. That was when Bruce Babbitt was governor and he thought that it would be a good reward for the kids that are in prison to um, have this reward where they can go work with animals um, if, they, if they're on good behavior and things like that. Well, because we were attached to the prison, it couldn't really be a public facility where people could just come visit. It became very difficult to do that. So we, we, we were struggling with that. We have since moved our wildlife center to um, our, our headquarters up on Carefree Highway, but it is still in a transition. So we don't, um, we're still, getting the animals used to the new places we're developing new handling protocols all these different things that are going on to it it is possible that in the and there's still construction we are basically in phase one or two of a multi-phase project um the intention eventually hopefully will be to build an education center out by where the wildlife center is in which case we'll have some stuff in the future but right now we don't do field trips right now we don't even have volunteers at the center that'll hopefully change pretty soon as well um but there are other organizations that are out there that you could do field trips with. Um, I know she's listening on here, but there's there's a um, mesquite um, wildlife oasis out in the West Valley, the extreme West Valley out by Buckeye um, has um, field trips that they offer that during the school year, you have to get in and register for those pretty early because they only have a limited number of slots that they're available. Um, if you want to reach out to me, um, Valerie, I can try to hook you up with some of these these field trips if you're interested. Uh, Ricky asked, are the bone boxes provided by region in the state, and will they possibly be accessible when things get back to normal, or will the digital option be the only way to have students view the bones? So, Ricky, that's that's a really good question, um, and the, the short answer, so the answer to your first part is yes, they are provided around the region, so all of our regional offices have bone boxes, and then there are some other locations that have them as partnered with to try to make them even more accessible. Um, but as far as moving forward, I, I, I got to be honest with you, I don't know what the status of our bone boxes is going to be. Um, I suspect what's going to happen, and this is what I'm in the process of working on right now, is that we're going to have some sort of modified version of a bone box. I don't know if the bone box is going to look like the way it's always looked, um, largely because um, 
the cleaning protocols related to it, right? And some of those things in there are going to be that, like the furs and, and, and the hides are going to be harder to clean. And so when we get, if we're, if we're trying to limit exposure to things like the viruses and stuff like that, um, it might be harder to clean the, the, the hides. Um, so what I'm looking at is creating smaller versions of the bone boxes that, that, are, that are much more directed towards specific activities. So that there might be a bone box that's, um, that has certain specific skulls and the idea is that you're going to teach a, a certain, a couple certain concepts with this. doesn't mean that, th so there'll be multiple bone boxes boxes of different types, um, but the skulls, our hope is that the skulls will still be available. We are also working on more of a virtual option. I'm in the process of recording the skulls, making video clips of the skulls so that your students can see them virtually without having to have them in their hands. But we know that that's not ideal. We would love it to get those skulls in the hands. We're just exploring what those options might be. Um, so I think, Um, so we had a question, is the amphibian one from last week still accessible? Um, yes and no. So if you send me a follow-up email, I should be able to send you the link of that webinar as it occurred, um, the, the, the link that's in the software system. As I mentioned, usually I will take these webinar recordings and I will put them on our website, but I usually to do that, I do some editing and it's not editing to change much. The only thing I'm doing is like I'm editing out the references to like upcoming workshops and things like that. Um, so that they're more timeless. Um, they can stay on our website and they're not having to say, oh, if you come back next week, there's a webinar. I take all those references out and I put them on so that it, it can be watched at any time. That takes me a little bit of time and then it's publicly available on our website. But if you email me, I should be able to send you the link to the web, the unedited version of the webinar as it took place. Um, I think I can do that. So it looks like that's all the questions. We have run late. I thank you for for, for bearing with me and, and hanging in there, guys. I, I appreciate it. I am humbled that you chose to spend an hour of your your time with me. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. If you have any further questions or email, um, feel free to email me. So thanks a lot, guys.